All right. So before I start, did someone attend to the DevOps days recently? One, two, three, four. So this talk uh, is basically an extension of the, what we had in DevOps day. So I present this in five minutes. It's really fun, right? <laughs> it's really fun when you see the slides coming on up. But so uh, initially, we wanted to actually make a representation. But uh, I submitted a little bit too late, so they pushed us to, to uh, Ignit. So before we start, uh, I would like to, to do a shout out to, to Vincent Honisby for hosting this event. Also, the organizers here, Nirap and Sigis, uh, are the, guilt, the guilties that made us to come here and spend some time together and share some experience. So, this talk is going to be uh, a little bit less technical, and we're going to go through a practical case on how we actually migrate from uh, Nagios uh, to Prometheus. So who did use uh, Nagios before? OK. Uh, who many of you like Nagios? Before. <laughs> you like Nagios? Before. Ah, oh, OK, OK. I'm going to throw you away. OK. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's let's get started. I see that you guys have some some experience and and you uh, probably have experienced some pains, so you can uh, share my empathy here. So so let's start. So hi, uh, I'm Antonio. I'm a SRE at Cloudflare. I'm based here in Singapore, and I've been working with uh, with Bean, Nira, and Sigis, and Jason and Monica in our. Uh, our journey to uh, um, get rid of Nagios and improve our our monitoring. Um, so uh, I'm going to go with this very fast. Basically, a quick introduction. So SREs, we do monitoring, and it's our our heartbeat, right? So uh, there were some challenges when we scale up. We found some challenges. Our uh, infrastructure is is massive. So as we grow, as more challenge we we got. So we're gonna share here how uh, we solve it and the journey. So back in 2009, when when uh, Cloudflare started, we had like barely 50 servers, a uh, few data centers around the world. I think primarily in US, and we were growing very slowly. And by that time in 2009, uh, like. 100 servers was like, wow, you really, you really rock, right? You have 100 metals, you have one, 100 servers to manage. So your, your SSH loop should be like uh, quite long. So uh, yeah, so, but that time we start using Nagios. I'm on the monitoring, uh, using monitoring, well, I'm on the IT industry since like 12 years. So I started doing SSH loops, then I started doing Nagios, and then Sabix, and now uh, Prometheus. For me, Prometheus is kind of new. Uh, since I started with Cloudflare, I had no idea what Prometheus was. I just barely heard it. So I learned a lot. Uh, but I kind of stick with the old philosophy to, to use uh, Nagios and black box monitoring and so on. So, so uh, this was actually the, the standard uh, by Cloudflare at that time, and it was great, but the small scale, because it also it also had like big community, it also had plenty of documentation, plenty of uh, of plugins, so it worked great. But as we grow, as the problems that come, right? So basically, uh, we had problems like we were missing monitoring points with Nagios. We had uh, frequent crashes because Nagios could not handle that load. Uh, keep in mind that Nagios, but that, that that point, it was having like 1,000 checks, 1,000 checks per server, right? Um, single point of failure. Nagios doesn't really had a good HA setup, so um, yeah, this is this is obviously a, a, an issue, and it's also it's very hard to make changes, right? It's very hard to make changes in Nagios. Uh, everything is uh, kind of centralized, and the, the, the file, the, the, the um, uh, config file is big, and uh, it uh, has a lot of uh, 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 beautiful views that we will see. So there was how our initial setup 
was more or less, so we have one central Nagio servers, and then we keep adding pops. Every pop of presence, not all point of presence were the same. Some of them are very small, very tiny, and some of them are huge. Right? We have some pops in South America, uh, sorry, North America, that they can have like uh, like uh, plus 300 servers or 400 servers there, and we have some in uh, in Asia that or in Africa they can have like three. Right? So obviously this uh, this uh, this is a big uh, this is a big uh, difference, right? So this is how actually our um, our um, infrastructure looks like now. It's it's a spot. This blue spot is one point of presence we have. So I I've been uh, been uh, through this before, so I don't want to spend much time on this. But this is actually our scale and our Nagio server was somewhere there, <laughs> somewhere, right? It's in a secret location, right? Uh, so was somewhere there. So imagine, right? Or sending sending uh, packets to 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 Nagios, right from from several locations, but the most and the most lovely area was this one. That was the most lovely area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who have been in China before, or who have experienced the Chinese network, know what I'm talking about. So yeah. So talking about problems again. So uh, we had issues where the high number of connections, we lose data real time. The configuration file of Nagios is uh, not optimal. Uh, every time that we make a change, we have to touch the configuration file. And very often, we break when we change the configuration file for adding an alert, for adding a, a notification group, or uh, any other uh, parameter of Nagios. It's very easy to break. right? And then you are basically uh, out of monitoring for the time that you have fixed it. right? So this is actually not, not ideal. So this is how a configuration file looks. Uh, I don't want to look at it too, too long because I start to have headaches. But this is, this is actually how Nagios uh, uh, a configuration file looks like. So according to all these problems, we start to look for, for solutions, right? So uh, we need something that was like uh, had some sort of HA, act, active standby setup, uh, that uh, Arseni also mentioned that can also monitor itself. Right, so I can monitor myself, and Nagios can monitor itself. Uh, so uh, also has like uh, something that uh, has the host service dependencies and can basically quick, quick uh, come back in case of of, uh, of failure or outage. Uh, so we want also to to send uh, alerts to different to different sources. We have we use. Um, our chat system, we, have, we, we use our uh, pager system, and so on. And something that it was basically uh, easy to customize and as our environment changed very fast, right? So we basically, we were looking there for the, for the flexibility of, of the solution, right? Um, also, we want something that as we add nodes or uh, uh, we add machines or services, Basically, they can auto-register every time, so it saves a lot of a lot of uh, work. So we choose, of course, I think you guess. Uh, we choose uh, Prometheus. Why? Because it's robust, has a HA setup, uh, can handle millions and millions of time series. So millions and millions of metrics means millions and millions of alerts we can process. And as been showed before. Uh, you can create uh, news alerts very quickly and easy and fle in a flexible way using prom, prom SQL, right? Also, troubleshooting Prometheus is uh, very easy. Have you, uh, the Prometheus users, have you ever had any issues with Prometheus on the, on the service level? Someone? No one? That's why we are here, right? Because Prometheus is great. No, but. But it's, it's quite it's just a, a Go Go program, which is actually very uh, very easy to install. So uh, you can you can very easily do, do, dockerize it and run it, right? So so actually it's so simple. Um, has also a big community and uh, fulfill basically our scalability demands, right? As Nirav said before, we our our. Uh, our our infrastructure is growing every single day. 
but well, the time I started was earlier, earlier this, this year. I think we had around 100 pops. Now we have around 140 something. 130, so 130 uh, pops. So obviously, with this, uh, with this uh, uh, grow, with this grow, we cannot like stick a, uh, with a non non scalable solution, right? So Nagios Prom versus Prometheus. So basically, uh, Nagios is based on, based on a script. So basically, it runs a script and gives you one output, which is zero, one, or two, right? which uh, is informative, if something goes wrong, uh, but, uh, well, I mean, this not, doesn't tell much, right? <laughs> so, um, so if you want to basically modify an, an alert, or you want to modify, make a small modification in a, a specific check in Nagios, you have to basically start to script. You have to if you want to monitor the uh, number of requests, uh, for instance, as been shown us before, and uh, you decide that uh, 1,000 requests per second are way too much, and then you want to change it to, to, then to 500, you have to basically change the script. You have to go and check the script in Agios, right? Which is basically, uh, it's, it's in theory easy, but it's kind of an overhead, right? Because you have to actually deploy this script and push it on all the servers you have, and, and so on. So uh, in Prometheus, as you saw before, you, you just need a metric, right? Uh, in Prometheus, uh, just requires like a prompt SQL query. And then you got the alert, and you got the metric. So you are, you are, you're good to go. So OK, so let's migrate, right? OK, so well, okay, we have Nagios, so we decided Prometheus, because Prometheus is great. So we're going to migrate, OK? Uh, we, d we actually migrate from Nagios to Prometheus uh, overnight. No, actually. But, but, but some, some of you with the face, you believe it. You were impressed. Some of you were impressed. No, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm lying. So, uh, well, actually, it was not trivial. It cost us uh, a lot of time, right? Uh, for a few reasons. First off, is like uh, we cannot have a monitoring blackout. We can't. We simply can't. Uh, we need to uh, ensure reliability in, in between the two systems. So you have Nagios, which is actually running, and then you add a new thing, which is Prometheus, which, yes, uh, is great, but you, know, you, know, you don't want to basically put all your production environment depending on something that you, uh, a solution that you just put on the table, right? Which everyone thinks is great, and we think it's wor it works, but you have this uh, Nagios working uh, for years, and it works. So you basically want to have both of the systems running to see if uh, actually the, the solution that you're implementing is basically covering you 100% of your monitoring, right? And uh, yeah, so basically uh, you don't have a space for downtime. You're going to have downtime for your monitoring, right? If you have uh, downtime in your monitoring, you are flying blind, right? So. So comparing Nagios again, this is how actually Nagios works, right? Or or, you, or used to work at least. Um, so you have uh, the Nagios remote uh, program execution, which uh, uh, basically uh, goes to communicate with the server. Inside the server will basically uh, execute a script, right? Savix do it on very sim in a kind of similar way too. So basically, Savix also rely on a, a client uh, a client server. Uh, architecture, so this is more or less the the old all the school monitoring. So um, yeah, so you basically you can imagine that one of these checks are one script, and in each server we have more than one thousand, right? So our uh, USR lib uh, libexec uh, Nagios, when you run uh, ls, it take a while, right? So yeah. So as I said before, NRP runs give you back three values. OK, warning and critical. And down, I think, I believe. Down, so we show something. And uh, um, so, yeah, so again, uh, massive uh, script deployment for each check. Uh, the logic is built in inside the script, inside the, uh, the, the server. So uh, every time that you deploy a new, a new, or you change a threshold, or you do anything, you have to validate the script. Uh, as we said before, that a simple threshold will will basically give a, an overhead. I'm not gonna go with this like 
I'm going to go with this fast as uh, Bean and uh, Arsene already go through it, but this is actually how Prometheus looks like. So it's kind of for its illustrative process to compare it with, uh, with, um, um, with Nagios. So you have like alert manager and uh, like uh, the data center Prometheus is pushing the alerts to alert manager and the alert manager will send the notifications to the, the, the proper channel, right? So, so this is actually the, the architecture that we aim for and we are having. Implemented, so we basically have in each pop we have like uh, like one uh, Prometheus uh, server, and then we have like running on our core infrastructure. Uh, we have like uh, uh, redundancy on two Prometheus servers too, right? So we basically we do use federation. So we basically uh, we're sending all the metrics are available here. So where we migrate. Some initial considerations that, that we, we had to, to take is like make sure that exporters, of course, uh, show the metrics on the endpoints. We have to uh, make sure that the metrics are pulled by the, by the Prometheus server. Uh, as I said, we have a, a hierarchical federation setup. And uh, finally, uh, we need to the alert manager evaluate the metric and push if required to our proper channel. So we have to ensure that the, all the communication goes goes smoothly to the to the uh, to the uh, endpoint, right, on the alert. So, how we implement? What were the steps that uh, uh, we made in order to migrate all these alerts that we have in Nagios to Prometheus, right? So. The implementation was like we take one to one alert and we, we just basically bring it all the way to Nagios with Prometheus with this path I'm going to describe, right? So, so depending on the metric, uh, we will need to uh, deploy an exporter, right? As we have, as Bean has said before, as mentioned, an Arsene, uh, we have available like 15 exporters. Actually, Bean is writing a, a new one for backup PC. Right, so uh, as he said, it's very, it's kind of easy to, to uh, write a new exporter, but of course we have services that they don't have their own exporter, so we have to use text file exporter that we, I will mention uh, uh, later. Right, so so we okay, so we got the metric, so we, we, we got like the mechanism to back to to get the metric, whatever it is, right? So then we need to put the metrics and make sure that the, all the, uh, the HTTP, HTTP endpoints are showing the metric there, right? So then, uh, so we, then we need to uh, make sure that the, uh, the all metrics uh, are being aggregated. So you will see like the metrics basically from, from everywhere. I mean, not from everywhere, from every color, but in a, in a not on horizontal way, but a vertical way, right? And then uh, you have to define the alert rule. So once you have the metric, you have to actually define when to alert, right? Because sometimes it's not not that trivial, right? So when you want to alert, you have to actually it, it actually requ requires a lot of thinking, right? So uh, we need to make sure that the uh, the, the logic match our uh, current uh, monitoring points. So you have to basically. Make sure that the logic you have implemented in your script is going to match 100% with the, the logic you implement in, in Prometheus. Once we got the alert and the metric is ready, so we deploy it, right? We, uh, we deploy it and we push it to a, to a test, a channel of a test notifications, right? So then we uh, verify that and we make sure that the alert is firing properly and it has escalated to the proper channels too, obviously, right? And then when we test that everything looks fine and this alert is actually uh, showing at the, sa at the same time than the Nagios alert, right? Then we can say that we are done. So we drop the analog for Nagios, we reload Nagios, and we count one day of life less for Nagios, right? So this is more or less how the, um, uh, we are implementing the, the, the change. Any questions? Anything? Yeah, yes. That's quite interesting. So, how did you manage like this run book? I believe this was like per set of alerts or somehow. Mm -hmm. Once you define the process, mm -hmm. how did you do that in bulks, in batches? Because I guess you had a lot of alerts, a lot of metrics to, to export. So your question goes a little bit more into how we how uh, manage the process of transition. Yeah. The process of transition on the run books, you mean? Yeah. 
So basically, uh, in Nachish, you can define a, um, a, a link. You can define where actually your uh, your alert will lead, lead you for. In 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 Prometheus, when you actually de define an alert, there is a there is a field called link that you can actually paste your your runbook for each alert, okay. right? So it's quite flexible on that. So, so you, you oh, okay, and then make, uh, how did you actually during the transition time when mm -hmm. you redefine this metric? Yeah, did you do it like manually, semi-manually, fully automatic? Like when you move them from the definitions in Negios to definitions. Uh, so so the question is. How we uh, have moved uh, the um, uh, definition, like the definition of the alert from Nagios to Prometheus, right? How can we move the, all the alert def the, uh, definition from Nagios to Prometheus? So the question, is, the answer is, we have to do it manually. I mean, I mean, you have like you have to uh, basically uh, we didn't process like the, the Nagios config file and, and push it to a uh, created in Prometheus. No, because because how actually Prometheus is organized. Right, how we actually organize Prometheus, it has nothing to do with the Nagios organization, right? So some alerts were old, so we, some alerts we, we just remove it, and some alerts we just uh, bring the, uh, the Rombu manually when put it into, into the, the Prometheus. Sadly, we couldn't come up with an with automatic way, because those systems are so different and there is no basically good rule. Also, the logic is sometimes need to be changed. Uh, there was like in Nagios, keep in mind, we ran Nagios from 2009. So we were, there was like some alerts for some service that even don't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. So any questions here? Yes. So did you have any uh, binary checks like, you know, um, this service is up or is down? And Probably that's all, all you need. Uh, yes, and yes. Then how, how did you, because then uh, from, yeah, migrate that from Nakios to from Prometheus, because Prometheus is all metrics, right? So, yeah. Uh, did you just translate that into a zero or one? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Zero so the, the, the question is uh, binary checks that requires OK or not OK, how are we going to migrate it, right? So the answer is yes, we had those checks. And we have basically a, a special metric. You can just pull a metric, which, as you said, is a binary. It's a zero or a one, or zero or something, right? We also thought that the, the uh, depending on what type of alert, uh, kind of bring a magical number like a negative zero dot zero nine 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 to kind to avoid the the, the, the multi-dimensional spaces. But they actually is not really uh, uh, what we are doing, right? So we have not implemented this. But so your question, yes, we have a couple of ch of, uh, of alerts that are up, a zero, or one. Yes. Yeah. Let's continue. So uh, for migrate alerts, one of the one of the things that we we must know if you want to go into that journey too is like I promise you rely on exporters. Again, we said. Uh, exporters will expose all the metrics of your service. Uh, keep in mind that exporters are a separate process, right? Which is something that you actually need to take care of. Uh, a separate process is also a, a hall of security. You have to configure firewalls and running a new extra process in a machine is, even if it's small, is always a you know, it's uh, something I have to consider, right? We are a security company, so we actually have to, to look at after that very well. Um, so also, uh, some considerations you should do, like uh, black box exporter, uh, very common use for uh, HTTP, uh, TCP pros metrics. So if you have, if you can use a black box exporter, uh, it's more simpler. I suggest you to use it instead, right? That uh, overcomplicates stuff on white box, uh, white box uh, approach. And uh, also, you need to know that all the metrics uh, scrape from the exporter uh, every given time, right? So you have to also set your define the time that you want actually to scrape your metrics, right, very, very, very wisely. As I said, exporters require changes on firewalls. Um, and deploy, uh, uh, you need to reserve a, a new port because uh, obviously it will run uh, of their own port and it's not always possible. Uh, sometimes we don't have exporters for uh, our, our service. So, so then you have to cook it yourself, right? You don't have, you know, I don't have exp uh, an exporter for 
um, any any service you can imagine, right? Uh, for instance, we we were a practical case. We had still running uh, a piece of old software which uh, was legacy. It was called Backup PC, which is basically Perl. And uh, we were debating or either go to uh, use text file exporter or write our own exporter, right? And since we want to get <laughs> rid of Nagios as soon as possible, we say like, hey, we're going to just put uh, our text file exporter and push the metrics there. And uh, then later we will work on a on a um, on a black box exporter, right? Uh, sorry, on a backup PC exporter, right? Uh, actually, uh, Bing has some some work done on it, so uh, uh, it, it's actually looking good. So uh, you need to know that the text the text file exporter will actually help you to export any metrics, uh, runs as a cron job inside the um, inside the, the server. And if you need a specific metric or service to develop, uh, is basically the, the fastest way you can go. It's the right, going out to write your, your, uh, your own exporter, which can be a little bit of, of, of overhead, but it, has, but it totally depends on your case, right? If you're going to have like, like uh, uh, tonos metrics to, to export, maybe text file exporter is, is a problem rather than a solution. This is. Uh, uh, a slide that I stole, right? So I basically it's for uh, uh, showing purposes. Uh, Been already show it, but it's actually extract from uh, Matt Bostock talk. So he uh, was the basically the brain of the all our Prometheus infrastructure we had, and I really recommend you to to watch their their video the conference on YouTube if you have interest. You just go to YouTube and uh, type uh, uh, Prometheus Cloudflare. And then you will see him uh, uh, for sure, and maybe me also in the future. Maybe Who knows? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the so future challenges. Um, we had like a conversation before when we start to work in uh, on that project. We have an issue with uh, with uh, the freshness, right? So we had uh, a lot of problems getting metrics from uh, uh, get, get, getting metrics from uh, from. Basically, the way that we, we collect metrics didn't allow us to know if this metric was fresh or wasn't, right? Uh, there were some brainstorming on the way, but uh, apparently there is an update, and I think they claim to solve it on the next uh, Prometheus version. So uh, Nagios actually can tell you if, if, uh, if the metric or the, the monitoring point is actually old, but Prometheus, uh, this version can, but the, uh, the version two, I think it's it's already solved, right? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, that's the, the the presentation. So I don't know if you have any further questions. Um, I actually just want to add. Can you go back to the last slide? Sure. Um, so uh, the main problem with FreshNet it actually come from using the text files button. For, for the other normal spotter, you can tell if the uh, target that you are scraping is up or down, or then you can know it like if that's a uh, fresh or not. But then, if you're using text file spotter, then it's just a file on this, and then uh, even if the file doesn't change, you don't know about that one. One way you can do that, you can monitor the modify timestamp of the file, but it's actually way too complicated. Yeah, exactly. So the main problem is just for uh, text file spotter. Exactly. If we, we we decide to go in that way, we have to actually to, to do another another monitoring for for each each single single file. So so we will like a, a recursive forever with an infinite loop, right? Yeah. No more questions. Do you encrypt when you access your metrics endpoints? If we encrypt our the question is if we encrypt our our endpoints, and the answer is uh, uh, no. We don't encrypt it, and we don't encrypt it because we are using basically a, a TLS NSL, and we have our our uh, security uh, in place. So we have our security metrics in place, so we basically don't don't need to to encrypt it. So, so you mean you mean you access your when you scrape, you access your endpoints on your TLS now. This is what you are saying. So yeah, so we, well, we our endpoints uh, are scripted when they are traveling traveling for for our uh, uh, network. I think it's not the, not it's not the case we, because they're traveling over Anika's network. So I don't think that we have ever 
ever. I think to put a simple way, we're using HTTPS for encryption. Yeah. It's all over HTTP, uh, HTTPS. Oh, but he's talking about the exporter endpoint yeah. itself. So right? my question so, is, like, when you if you're saying you use HTTPS, my question is, do you do HTTPS for each exporter? Yes, that's what we do. Uh, so you built in, uh, so you link HTTP, you link your exporter with a TLS library. No, that's not correct. Uh, no. So, so then the way we architecture our Prometheus deployment is in each in each box there is a Prometheus server which scrapes all the local endpoints, and that's a trusted network. That's another so internal network. network. Internal network. Yeah. network. Yeah. network. And it's, it's still plain HTTP. HTTP. Okay, and then? And then once we the generate metrics, that's over HTTP. Yeah, so we will go to yeah, on, the, on the on the on the Yeah, yes. but again, the Prometheus. So if you talk about the integration of this, yeah, case, okay. Right? So, so Prometheus itself does not. Have no, uh, it's just behind the Nginx. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Prometheus itself. So and basic uh, and uh, the client, the scraper, does not have TLS either. So you do the proxying. Uh, I think Prometheus can scrape over it. Yes. Uh, I think definitely. Uh, Prometheus just you go client, HTTP client, and it definitely support HTTPS. Yeah. Okay. And I was missing something. Okay. So basically, here, here the metrics are basically on HTTPS. Uh, sorry, on HTTP. So on this level. So when you go like like out of the colo or of the port of presence, the 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 metrics uh, they are actually um, the path is encrypted. Yeah. So yeah, out in the case. The end point is actually. Uh, not encrypted. And yeah. for understanding, yeah. yeah. Do you also indicate when you scrape? No. Uh, yes, yeah. We we don't do uh, client authenticate when we scrape okay. over HTTPS. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, IP table rule that I only allow a uh, specific set of machine that can scrape uh, the call. So we uh, mm -hmm. so I mean to give more background, Cloudflare is a CDN company, right? So we run our own network, and we are also a security company. Yeah. We run our own network, we set our own network layer firewall rules, machine layer firewall rules, and uh, we, we, we roll our own HTTPS. And so uh, I get what you're saying that about authentication, but uh, we are, right now, uh, we don't expose a lot of sensitive, like we don't expose any customer data at all, or uh, it, this is all just, uh, uh, no, I, I'm not implying anything. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, the question. So is it just, uh, if this was, wasn't a valid question, I apologize. No, no, it, 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 it was totally valid. It's a, it's a valid question. So, so actually, it it um, it made me think a bit, though, because um, uh, as far as I were, were working Prometheus inside on the on the on the colo level, we don't use subscription. It goes like you basically with a, with a, a simple colo, you just get like uh, like uh, over HTTP, you get all the metrics. So um, uh, with it, when we aggregate, actually, I think we, as Nira say, we have secured <coughs> our network. So we don't need actually to to add this overhead on the on the um, on the flow, right? So we we don't basically. So well, let let's be let's be very real. How many world uh, customers we know that use SNMP with TLS or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> SNMP does not has not do TLS, but SNMP it does. Free, SNMP three, yeah. SNMP three does encryption. It's not TLS. Uh, and some do. So, yeah, I, I'm yet to see one. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the real world. Yeah. I have a different this question. Is, yeah, sure. Um, so it has been highlighted that the data storage in Prometheus is not a like not long-term storage. Fifteen days was mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I assume there's also is there anything on like um, downsampling or is that all handled in in the time series database or? Uh, it's all handled in that, uh, 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 and you can define your uh, uh, downsampling uh, intervals. Like you can set it to as granular or uh, or as high as you want. Okay. <coughs> so. I think the reason is that like Prometheus focus is right now in not to be a long-term story, right. but it doesn't mean that you cannot do it for a long-term story. Uh, the reason we have to limit it for 15 days is because we have just too many metrics, and then we then no uh, not being able to store more than like 15 days. Right. And otherwise, we just fill up our uh, hard drive. Prometheus uh, V2 did make very significant strides in terms of storage. They are now providing much uh, better adapter support for click house, for create, for influx. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But then the tiering will be done by some sort of process local to the Prometheus service itself, right? 
Yes, <coughs> there will be a Prometheus adapter that will take from the Prometheus server and, and push yeah, it. Yeah, but the Prometheus, process, Prometheus, push, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Prometheus itself uh, wants to remain fast. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a, a like the, that's one philosophy that I think Prometheus has followed really well. Like for, for example, uh, as he talked about that Telegraph also does scripts, right? But Telegraph runs these scripts itself, right? The, the Telegraph runs the scripts itself and then, the, uh, uh, then, then gets whatever matrix and then exports it out to Prometheus, right? What, what uh, Pro Prometheus node exporter also had this choice that it could have run these text file exporter scripts themselves. But they said that we want our node exporter to be really, really fast. So, and we don't want this different, they, if they don't control the script, they don't know how much time it will take, right? Mm -hmm. So Prometheus's focus has always been on speed. So it's like you write the text file and, and, and processing a text file and, and, uh, and uh, reporting it back on the HTTP endpoint is really, really fast. So that's, uh, so that's one thing uh, about uh, Prometheus, I guess, that it is built to be fast. That is why we have been able to scale at this level, right? And that is why uh, they did not focus on long-term storage at the start because long-term storage uh, comes with this uh, uh, comes with its own issue where like uh, how how do you horizontally scale and all of that which they didn't want to uh, uh, handle at that uh, at that particular point. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyone of us can you, answer. How do you um, do you have any redundancy with the alert manager um, because it's supposed to dedupe the alert? So uh, right now. We don't, but we are building redundancy. And the thing is, uh, both uh, both Prometheus uh, and uh, Alert Manager, uh -huh. we, we, we can uh, uh, we can have redundancy, and Alert Manager can uh, deduplicate between uh, other things too. But the thing is, uh, why we don't have right now, and why we're, we're going to build it later? We, we do have backup Alert Manager. We don't have, but we don't we don't have high availability. As in, like uh, uh -huh. uh, as in, like if one goes down, we'll have another one uh, uh, come up. But it's not uh, it's not like they're both not active active. But it's, yeah, it's in an active backup stage. And um, why do we uh, do it this way is that, look, what, what happens in Nagios is that all the alerting uh, yeah. logic or, uh, uh, is either at the node or is either, uh, 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 is either on the server, like the service goes down, up, up down, whatever, warning critical, right? What, uh, what you can do with Prometheus is that like, uh, since we have colo level Prometheus, like we have Prometheus at each of our lo uh, locations, and we uh, copy the alerting logic everywhere. So, so when Prometheus sends alerts, it's only sending like just like, let's say you have thousands and thousands of alerts defined, right? Uh, alert manager does not need to care about these thousands and thousands of uh, 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 thousands and thousands of uh, like uh, th uh, things. The Prometheus on a local level cares about it, and it only sends when alert fires to alert manager. Mm -hmm. So, it's not very uh, it, it's not very high scale. It's not uh, it's not taking up that much uh, like. Uh, it's not taking up that much resources or that we need like two uh, two running in active active so that is why we are running right now in active backup so this backup still receives the alerts from all the other prometheus servers uh only. no but so then your situational awareness if your active is down so how do you, and you know your picture of the world uh i can answer that so there are two parts of that so actually uh, it's a very interesting question because that right now alert manager yeah, housing of our file in monitoring uh, but there's two reasons one is that like uh, alert manager have some mass viewing at like, but they're still in beta state. So basically, there's no head A setup available for alert manager at the moment. Uh, the other thing is that we actually monitoring alert managers using Grafana. So there's Grafana alert that like, actually trigger if uh, alert manager going down, and there are also uh, Prometheus also like alerting uh, querying alert manager for its metric. So if there's something wrong with alert manager, then we can also also observe it from Prometheus side. Like if the number of alert go sending out is not like at high as that the alert are coming in or uh, something like immediately wrong with alert manager. Mm -hmm. And then like we also have alert in Grafana if like alert thing if alert manager is going down. Okay. I think it's more it's not more not about the uh, alert manager stability as is uh, because once it's run it's it's a neat pretty simple piece of software. Yeah. So once it's running it, it probably would be running and if it has some bugs which affects its stability, one could guess that they would be fixed fairly quickly. So you can rely on the fact that it is running. But I think that the problem might be is that if you have some some form of uh, continuous integration for your alert rules, like when you push uh, rules into into the thing and it gets like 
made is up after some auto tests, which I heard Google does, but I don't know if anyone else does really because I'm not sure how you can write, except for maybe a simple lexer, how you can actually validate uh, the alert manager rules. So what you can do theoretically is you mess up that and then you would be in, in some trouble depending on that on how, how that turned out. Yeah. Something related to that actually, um, so we have a simple setup that are actually uh, testing our uh, whole flow from, um, there would be a simple job that trigger uh, metric and then I trigger an alert on alert manager. Uh, like, uh, we, we do some kind of like, um, follow the stun mode of operation, so there are like eight hours sit between uh, different operation team around the world. And then at the beginning of visit, there will be an alert that I actually trigger internally and then go to, through alert manager to pager duty and then I go to the on con uh, person. So that way that I, the on con person is actually expecting to, to be able to know that like our alerting and monitoring is still work and then like the alert do actually get to this take home. Shift or shift. Yeah, it's like a fire drill, right? Like a, we call it a drill, a, an escalation drill to make sure that all parts of our uh, monitoring stack are working. Okay. Prometheus is forwarding to alert manager, alert manager is forwarding to page duty and all the, the, the whole cycle is working. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a schedule thing, yeah. So you're actually doing it uh, every eight hours, so like with that the whole flow on from the beginning of the shift, right? Yeah. On the shift. Yes, switch. yes, okay. yes. So we have uh, three offices, uh, uh, SF, London, and Singapore. So we, uh, all teams take eight hours each, and so f so, so, so at the beginning of every shift it uh, it triggers. You're also testing the humor. Yes. <laughs> You're also testing if the humor is awake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you being able to like your phone is not going like that or something like that. Yeah. We'll yeah. go to the next then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, uh, I will uh, just. Uh, are there any more questions? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, actually, asked this one uh, a while ago. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, the use case that I was also looking for our setup is the, the escalation of the alert. So, so let's say for that same alert, you know, uh, uh, it will be fired to the designated recipients, right? Then let's say you configured your alert manager to send every an, every hour. Then the following hour will send the same uh, same thing. But uh, what I'm looking at is uh, if this same alert happens in the next uh, uh, hour, I would like to send it to uh, let's say level two more. to level two. Mm -hmm. Some that someone who will poke this guys to hey, why are not why are still uh, so uh, I mean this is kind of not related to Prometheus but I'll just I'll I like manager, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so this is more about like uh, your this is more about how you want to handle alerts right so what we do is for business level alerts like this, this is uh, when, I, when I'm saying this is strictly for business level alerts what we do is we handle that logic in pager duty so what we uh, uh, so, so 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 what will happen is that like uh, uh, in uh, alert manager, you can uh, define multiple kind of receivers, multiple even uh, schedules in PagerDuty. So let's say you have three. Sh uh, you can like, uh, for example, set up three schedules. One with uh, one one which uh, uh, goes immediately and goes to the on call person, right? One which is a fifteen minute uh, delay and then goes to escalation. Or in your case, it could be a one hour delay. Or uh, one which is like three hours delay, which can go to the CTO. Or like like we uh, we are like one of those companies where alerts can escalate up to the CTO even. So like, you know, like it's, everyone is on call, like uh, like even the developers. So it's, uh, that kind of, uh, it's that kind of thing. So we handle that in PagerDuty. Like, that's what I want to say. Like, uh, we can set up like uh, custom uh, custom things. Like, okay, after, uh, if this person has not acknowledged, uh, the, the first person has not acknowledged and nothing has been uh, done and the alert is still firing, then it will go to uh, uh, the escalation. So automatically this one is you, you even manage the pager to the not the alert manager yeah 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 this this logic is uh, uh, we have uh, may, uh, we have made this logic in pager duty uh -huh. that the the the, the, the app itself all right yeah okay because uh, that's also another uh, uh, yeah, as i said it's not in our, in our case because 
we only have email, so <laughs> you can send emails to Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can send the mail to the cross mail script, uh, which will then yeah, keep do some do. state. If you need to do the uh, uh, but probably you should pay some the money the for Peter. Yeah, uh, these are these because and it's cheaper you know that they're so expensive. Just ignore it. I think that's what generally they want to email just ignore it. Yeah. And every yeah. file is email to be a defective. Like, like and if and you, you just other thing over email, then it will change the nice. human just to ignore it. Yeah. It's just nice. Yeah. Yeah. It is not worth doing uh, email other thing. Actually. Maybe creating Jira ticket, like a lot of manager have integration. <coughs> and actually, they, when you find another firing, it can create a Jira ticket. Yeah, so we do. Uh, might be something. We do like as easy as like if if, fill, if the disk is gonna fill up in four days, there's no need to wake someone up, right? Mm -hmm. So we file a Jira ticket, and some someone will come in and look, uh, take a look. But if it's gonna gonna go in like the next one hour, then it needs to be escalated. Right, so we uh, uh, so th that's the thing with alert manager. You can define like multiple page duty schedules, multi multi multiple things like Slack, hip chat, whatever, and all these receivers. You can say uh, 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 you can configure like okay, like uh, uh, I want to do a Jira and an alert and this. You can do all of that with alert manager, or or uh, or you want to do something like hey, I want to uh, notify the ops team, but also the dev team, and like that's, so that's also possible with alert manager. So okay, next I would like to kind of uh, end the thing. First of all, I would like to <laughs> end the, this meet, end this first meetup, I guess. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Vincent. Uh, if you guys didn't know, Vincent is the captain of the or the guy of Cloud Native Computing uh, in Singapore, in Singapore, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is a foundation which uh, was built by Linux and as now promoters like Google, promote, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all the big, uh, big things are behind it. And incidentally, uh, Prometheus and Kubernetes are both in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Like even our meetup was like uh, sponsored by Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So as you can see, Prometheus has a lot of uh, like developer uh, ecosystem uh, and push from the major companies behind it, like Kubernetes, and. As I said, like it's cloud native, it's built for uh, like uh, Prometheus. Uh, as you saw, uh, Ben talk about many Kubernetes uh, tools themselves comes with native endpoints for Prometheus ingestion of matrix, right? And so other ecosystems like Docker Swarm also. Are <laughs> yes, uh, and also the others, uh, 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 other uh, other ecosystems are uh, uh, also kind of uh, like as I said, Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm uh, now has Prometheus. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, at least I know that when I was still following it closely, it wasn't works. But uh, I think there's been several releases, and I think it's out. Oh, oh. Yeah. So the point is, like, white box monitoring is here to stay. And from what we are seeing is, like, all the major companies, Cloudflare, Google, Microsoft, all of them have kind of put their weight behind Prometheus. And as we talked about, like, yes, Prometheus does not uh, does not have all kinds of exporters. Or Prometheus does not have long-term storage, but it's working on it, right? It's a very new thing, and uh, it's a very new way of thinking about monitoring also, which is uh, 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 which is what uh, you must have seen, right? It's not just one zero uh, like critical warning, right? It's about total visibility. It's about like uh, like doing histogram quantize. Like, uh, did you know that it can also do data prediction? Like it can, it can actually do hold winters. There are native functions in Prometheus to do like hold winters modeling, which is like uh, if you it's a data analytics term, where it's, you, you can draw a smooth curve and see okay like when uh, even if something is not as uh, uh, like smooth as linear, you can do a proper curve and see like okay like when will this particular uh, condition be reached. So like and uh, so that's the kind of the way uh, we are heading and. Uh, of course, we are going to do more meetups for Prometheus, and uh, like uh, so, I would just uh, say, just go ahead and use it. Like, try it out. Uh, you can try it out from uh, 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 the GitHub URL that uh, uh, Ben showed. It's a pretty uh, pretty easy thing to set up, and yeah, it also has a Docker. Uh, it also has a Docker container which you can just run and uh, and, and start up an instance on your uh, on your local machines. Yeah, just try it out and post on the meetup if you have issues or other uh, things.
And I think if you are interested to talk, approach us. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you want to share uh, your experience with running Prometheus. Yeah, if you're just starting up and you hate it and you go back to that, you'll let us know. <laughs> 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 that would be very interesting to know, yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank